So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to all of you who are joining us from across time zones. And I'm sure for some of you, it must, must be very early in the morning. I'm Shantala Haridas from India Bioscience. So we are the technical host today and the publicity partners, and we are thrilled to be a part of this uh, webinar. Um, and this is a, and a warm welcome to all of you from us and all of the speakers and moderators for the first webinar from the working group on gender equality of the International Union of Biological Sciences or IUBS for short. Uh, so since we have a kind of power pack session today, I'm gonna to move forward with the introductions quite quickly. Could I have the next slide, please? So these are the speakers. You'll be hearing more detailed introductions about each of them as the webinar progresses today, but just a quick slide to show you who we have. So we have Catherine, Haley, Lucila, who's also a moderator, Renuka and Sarita um, as the speakers in today's webinar. And the moderators for today's webinar are John and Lucila. And so with that, um, let's get started. A few, just a very few, um, just a few uh, inputs on how to participate in today's session. Uh, we really hope that this is a very interactive session and we hear a lot from the audience. So the way you can participate is that if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box. Um, the chat box will be opened very periodically only when one of the speakers or a moderator opens a question to the audience and we want to hear, for, hear your inputs on this. Otherwise, the chat box will be closed and you can keep an eye on the chat box because you might, you might hear you know, uh, announcements or questions or links being shared in the chat box. But chat box will be open for interaction only for short periods of time. And if any of the questions that have come in via the chat box, if any of them are invited to ask the question in person, then that will also be announced. So there's uh, no need to, this uh, the raise hand icon will not be used in today's uh, webinar. So we hope that you, through the chat box, you, you, you submit questions, you participate actively. This is an important discussion uh, that, that is to be had. So with those brief, uh, instructions on how to participate. I just want to add that this webinar is also being live streamed in a variety of different platforms. So it's going out on YouTube, on Facebook, the IUBS Facebook page. It's going on going out on the India Bioscience LinkedIn page and on our India Bioscience website. So if for some reason you have difficulties joining us on Zoom, please move to one of these other platforms. There is somebody at all of these platforms who's moderating the session in the sense that they will collect questions from participants across platforms. So this, irrespective of where you're joining us, this will be an interactive session for you. So uh, these links will also be shared in the chat box and you can keep them for your reference. Um, at the start of the session, we just want to get to know a little bit about who you are who is joining us in today's webinar. Uh, so a quick audience poll. Uh, you should be able to see the audience poll. It's been launched. There are three questions. Uh, gender, I am from, which is basically where you're joining us from, the continent. And I am one of the following. So what is your career stage? What are you doing right now? And I think these would be really interesting uh, for us, for the speakers to know, to keeping in mind uh, for the rest of the discussion today. So we let this audience poll run for maybe 10 or 15 more seconds. I actively invite all of you to, to fill this up. It's three quick questions. Um, I see a lot of you have already filled it in, so thank you. Maybe we can have it run for a few more seconds. Okay, so um, I'm gonna share the results of this audience poll uh, with all of you. So you should be able to see the results on your screen. So in terms of gender, so we have a, a predominantly uh, female audience joining us, 81% uh, of the audience is female, 19% of the audience identifies as male. And I'm glad to see that little bit of diversity, hopefully in subsequent uh, sessions, this will, the, the kind of pendulum will swing more towards you know, a more diverse audience, but this is a discussion that is, you know, everyone should participate in. Um, moving forward, where are you joining us from? We have um, a large portion of you joining us from Asia, 71% of you are from Asia, 22% of you are from Africa. Uh, we have 2% from North America, 3% of you from Europe, it must be very early in the morning for all of you. Uh, and 2% from Australia. So we have a big, bit of a global mixture of the audience who's joining us today. 
And finally, in terms of what are you doing, what career stage are you at right now? We have, um, you know, more of a distribution here. Um, the majority, 45% of you are faculty members, scientists or researchers. 21% uh, of you are students who are doing your master's. 9% of you are doing your bachelor's. 10% are students who are currently pursuing their graduate degree, PhD students. We have some other science professionals as well, 12%, and some people, 2% of you who were not ca captured in any of these categories. Uh, so with this quick, uh, quick audience poll to give us an insight as to who you are, let's move forward with uh, today's webinar. So I'm going to quickly introduce uh, John Buckridge, who's one of the moderators, and I'm then going to hand it over to him to get this webinar started. So John Buckridge wears many hats. He's a professor emeritus in the Earth and Oceanic uh, Systems Group at RMIT University, Melbourne. He's internationally recognized for his research in both biogeography and evolution of barnacles and in the promotion of environmental stewardship across environmental ethics. He is the President Emeritus of the International Society of Zoological Sciences, a past president of IUBS, a past member of the Executive Board of International Council for Science, Paris, and a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So with that uh, introduction, over to you, John. Yes. Thank you, Shantana. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today, um, wherever we are, whether it's day or night. Um, I suppose I, I would like to say, uh, why are we doing this? Is perhaps the, the, the very, very rather interesting question that underlies everything. And that is that for many, many years, we have been underrepresented at the highest level. In other words, international societies and international unions by not having enough women um, on boards and executives. And in a sense, that's one of the things that's driven us to try and um, change this particular structure. In other words, if you can't get in there um, and at the highest levels, you can't make changes. I was having a, a talk today to a colleague who said, well, there are lots of women now who are in biological sciences. And in fact, there are more women than men. And I, I suspect that may very well be true in some areas. But is it true at the higher levels? And that's one of the things that we certainly feel is not the case. So in the past, we've had problems and they haven't been fixed today. And just look for a, a few seconds at things like the International Society of Zoological Sciences. We've just had our elections and we have a new executive board and officers, only one of whom is a female. So it's rather depressing when this happens. But nonetheless, um, these sort of things, this sort of action and activity and discussion group, hopefully will help us to mitigate this problem. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our participants. And I will be at this stage welcoming Lucia. And her presentation is um, going to come up in a few minutes. Uh, bioanthropologist she is with expertise in gender mainstreaming from the University of Florence. She is author of the book of Scatterlings and Stakeholders, Diversity, Inclusion and Transitional Governance of Sustainable Development. And uh, the title of her presentation today is Gender Gaps and the Biological Sciences. So prior to this, uh, there is a question poll we've, which we've done, um, and I suppose in some ways I've also answered that from my perspective. So I'd like to hand you over now to Lucia and uh, let's, let's um, hear what she has to say. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, John. Um, and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from Florence, Italy. I hope uh, this webinar finds you, you and your family well in this still very trying time. But let's get started. And before we start, allow me to ask you a question. Why are you attending this webinar? We're very curious, especially some of you are waking up pretty early to do that. Great. Um, we're going to see the results of this poll after my presentation to see if our expectation matches your results. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next. 
So I would like to open this webinar by recalling a quote by Nadine Gordimer, an amazing woman and writer, also Nobel Prize winner for literature. A good conference is not what happened behind closed doors, but what opens out of them. And why am I telling you this? Because this webinar is not supposed to be considered as a tick the box action. We've done our activity in gender equality. We are okay, fine. There's enough activity on gender being done by IUBS. No, this is just the very beginning of a conversation. And what we're trying to do is through these webinars is to trigger new conversation towards identify action in order to narrow the gender gaps in the biological science and beyond, of course. So on the basis of my experience as bioanthropologist and also working in science policy interface for over 20 years in international organization, I provide a, a brief overview of the following issue. Next. I'm going to give you an overview of the webinar series. Why are we doing this? John has already briefly introduced this, uh, this issue. Then I'll move just to recall on some concepts so that we all have the same concept in mind, not just that we want to force a particular concept, but we just want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about here. And we're going to conclude, and I'm going to conclude by giving you an introduction to this webinar, also to um, highlight that we're going to have specific question and answer session. Next slide, please. So um, as John was mentioning, I would like to restate that the webinar series is convened by the Working Group on Gender Equality of the International Union of Biological Sciences. And this group was born out of the General Assembly of IUBS in Oslo a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic times, as we say now. And really is to ensure that there is a fair gender representation in all activities conducted by the unions. And if you check out the website, you will see that some of the policy of IUBS are also gender aware and gender transformative. And in particular, the goals of the working group are to better understand scientific career pathways and impediments to the advancement of women within them. And so we try to investigate different uh, specific barriers. We're trying to determine best system and protocols that IUBS can apply to redress the problem. And also we try to have activities that will promote uh, women empowerment and gender equality. Next. The webinar series is one of them. Uh, and this is the first, the first one. And it's also, allow me to say that it's really a way uh, during the COVID pandemic to reach out and to have a conversation. We could really not do this in person anymore through different meetings and reaching out different constituencies. So we hope that you will also spread the word and tell other colleagues to join our webinar series in order to further enlarge the diversity of participants in the conversation. And you find all the information on our website. Next. So as I mentioned, um, the series is really to provide a framework to discuss issues related to different gender gaps, not just gap, gaps, and this I will underline afterwards, within the context of the biological sciences community towards identify action towards gender equity. We will address different topics as you will see today with, from promoting uh, uh, from promotion gaps, gender pay gaps, publication gaps, leaky pipeline, gender lens in research, harassment, and so on. But also we would like to hear from you on which topic you would like us to address. And there will be at the end of the webinar, a session dedicated particularly to that. And you'll be asked some question in order to help us. If you're not joining from Zoom, don't worry. You could always send us your comments and input afterwards also in the survey that will come at the end of this webinar. Next, please. OK, some concepts. Uh, many of you will know this, but I just would like to highlight uh, some of the concepts. These are the WHO working definition for sex and for gender. And then mostly to highlight uh, that in this context, we use a binary definition of gender. We're not referring to different gender identities, but mostly we're looking at male and females. Uh, so in this context, next, the gender gap, 
is the difference between women and men as reflected in social, political, intellectual, cultural, or economic attainments or attitudes. So I say gaps and not gap because there are many different gaps and it all depends on the context, on the kind of situation, on the branches of biological science you are in, in which university, in which lab, if you're also working in the private sector, there are many, many different gaps that needs to narrow and needs to be removed. And here are some examples. I mean, if you're doing field work, you will have different issues. If you're working in a lab, you have different ones. And of course, field work is different if you're in the forest or if you're in Antarctica. So we'll look at all this different situation. Next, please. So, but why we're doing this today? First of all, uh, is to mark the UN International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which is celebrated today by the United Nations and by many organizations around the world. Is through this webinar, we are hoping to contribute to building a culture of respect, equity, and equality because gender gaps are obstacle to equity and equality and hence should be narrowed and removed. And really, we're really building a culture of peace. And we all learned that there is a shadow pandemic going on. We're hearing lots of figures and number and statistics these days. I'm not gonna dwell on that, but let's take a moment to remember that some other women are not here today to listen to this webinar. So as I mentioned, the talks which are scheduled from exciting women will provide some insights. The question um, will uh, provide you an opportunity also to express your opinion. And uh, we hope that this uh, webinar will contribute also to the achievement of SDG number five. Next, please. So can we see the results? All right. Okay. Not many friends attending webinars. Okay. That's great. Uh, I want to learn more about gender gaps. Great. We're all on the same page. It's going to be an interesting journey. And I think um, that will, um, will be a great opportunity for all of us to learn from each other and to learn from the fantastic speaker, which will follow on the different gender gaps. I'm very, very happy uh, to see a 14% I've uh, never attended a webinar event on gender. Welcome to the community. We hope that is going to be the last one for you. And please feel free to reach out for clarification at the end of the, of the webinar. Thank you very much. And I give the floor back to John. Well, thank you very much indeed for that most illuminating talk. I should point out that this afternoon, I spent some time uh, looking at a, an interview that Lucia made or carried out with Jane Goodall. And it's worthwhile reflecting on that, that, that Jane um, began her studies without a formal university education. She was supported by a remarkable man, by Leakey. And as a consequence, she was able to achieve something that perhaps was um, unattainable except for the rather unusual circumstances and support she had. And a remarkable woman she is indeed. That interview, I understand, is available through the IUBS website. And it's certainly an inspirational thing to, to listen to. Um, I, I noted with some amusement that um, there are no, there's nobody in Antarctica listening to us. And I, I suppose that's understandable. Although remember that it's now the, the summer, it's coming up to the summer season in Antarctica. So there are probably um, penguins and things that could learn a lot from listening to us. I'd like now to go back and just mention very briefly uh, that we took the opportunity of clipping this on to the ISZS Congress. And I think it was a very appropriate and sensible thing to do because um, zoology is, is one of the main parts of biological sciences. And it's quite nice for us to reinforce the need for zoologists in particular to reach out and try and achieve a greater gender balance and to remove these, these gaps that certainly exist. With this in mind, I'm going to introduce our next talker. And this is Sarita Marie. Now, Sarita is a molecular systematist. She is past president of the um, <coughs> Zoological Society of South Africa. She um, is an executive member of the IUBS, and she has just been elected vice president of the International Society of Zoological Sciences. 
Sarita's work is in a, a really cute little animal. It's endangered, I understand. It's that golden mole, and she's somewhat of a world authority on this little animal, and I'm sure she will have a chance to hopefully mention that when she talks to us now. So, Sarita, uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. Sarita. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure to take part in this webinar. And since I'm living in Africa, I've had a challenge to share my presentation due to load shedding. So I thought that if possible, I could, I don't know, John, I could perhaps introduce Hayley and then she could um, speak ahead of me because that would make more sense at this point so that I can just find the backup of of what I need to do, and then at least I can speak from it. Would that be fine? John? Yes, uh, go, please go ahead, Sarita, and, and introduce Haley. Thank you. Okay, I just want to, sorry. Oh dear, <laughs> this is not helping at all. Sarita, I, I'm not sure what um, what the constraint is on your side, but I'm also happy to introduce myself if that would help to move things along. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just see. I can't believe this in front of all of these people. But, you know, Africa is, is not for, um, as they say, for sissies. <laughs> and uh, I will just, I just want to see if I. Um... Um, Sarita, yes. allow me to, allow me to introduce Haley because I'm a. Uh, I'm um, really, I'm really impressed with her work and with her CV. And this is also a great opportunity to advertise a new opportunity also for uh, for further research. I saw there are a lot of researcher um, attending the the webinar. So, Haley Clements is the inaugural recipient of the prestigious Jennifer Ward Oppenheimer Research Grant in 2019. This is a new a new opportunity for research grant which was established to honor the late Mrs. Jennifer Ward Oppenheimer. And so she continue her extensive contribution to and passion for Africa, the environment and science. She's a great researcher and conservationist. And we really look forward to hearing from her about her work. And please, everybody, if you're working in Africa, if you're from Africa, check out this new research grant opportunity. This is also a way how we can further gender equality by spreading the word about great opportunities like these. Haley, to you, thanks. Thanks very much, Lucia and, and Sarita. And um, as Lucia says, it really is a wonderful opportunity. I'll share a link uh, in the chat after my talk. Um, this grant has really enabled me to remain in science. Um, so I'm very happy to promote it. I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, Lucia, can you please give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen, full screen? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I, I feel like a bit of an imposter in the sense that I am not an expert on women in science. I just am a woman in science. Um, but the, this project that Lucia mentioned that I have this grant for, 
um, what was unexpected that emerged from it is this notable gender gap in um, African biodiversity experts uh, that I brought into the project. So what I'm going to do this morning is to just tell you a little bit about the project itself to set the context and the process that we went through in this project and then to, to highlight some of those gender gaps that emerged. Um, so as many of you will know, uh, the upcoming decade is critical around the world. It's also particularly critical in Africa where we're really experiencing rapid socioeconomic growth. That, that growth and development is navigated in a way that doesn't surpass a boundary of biodiversity loss beyond which we all are negatively impacted. Now, the major difficulty, or one of the major difficulties um, is in these aggregated biodiversity indices that we currently have that feed into international target setting, that goes down international policy, et cetera, is that they're really constrained by the kinds of biodiversity data that exist. Um, so they often only focus on proxies of biodiversity loss, things like habitat loss, or they just look at species presence, absence, or level of threat. Essentially, they tell us things about biodiversity loss that don't really capture how biodiversity contributes to ecosystem function, and thus ultimately to ecosystem services and human well-being. And so this project aimed to address this knowledge gap by quantifying what's called a biodiversity intactness index for Africa, and importantly, to do this through an Africa-wide collaboration of biodiversity experts. So just to explain briefly what the BII or the Biodiversity Intactness Index is, it's an aggregated index of the average impact of human land use activities on the abundance of diverse species in a region. And it's relative to what would have occurred in that region pre-industrial. Now, why it's believed to be a better index than some of the aggregated ones we have so far is because it focuses on abundance and the full suite of species, thus getting us closer to ecosystem function. Now, in an ideal world, we would be able to estimate how very diverse um, types of human activities across the continent are impacting on the tens of thousands of species that occur in the continent. But of course, in reality, that's not practical. And so we, we make two necessary simplifications. The first is to categorize this broad suite of human activities across the landscape into these quite distinct landscapes that are ca characterized by certain types of land use, human activity, et cetera. And then secondly, we group species into groups that we expect to respond similarly to change instead of trying to estimate them all individually. And I'll speak a bit more about that in a, in a little while. So at the core of the BII is this algorithm. Basically, it needs to know the area of these different landscapes that are across the continent, the richness of biodiversity within um, the different regions across the continent. And then at the core of it are these impact scores. So what is the impact of these different landscapes on the abundance of these different groups of species. Now, again, in an ideal world, we'd be able to measure that using field collected data. In reality, that's quite challenging. So this is one of the biggest databases around the world on uh, the occurrence and abundance of biodiversity. It's aggregated from a whole bunch of different published studies that have measured uh, the abundance of different species across different landscapes. And what you can see quite clearly here um, is that there's massive geographic gaps. Notably, the majority of the African savannas are missing in terms of uh, data on biodiversity. Um, and what you can't see here is that this data is also very biased to certain groups of species like uh, birds and mammals. And so what the approach that we're taking instead is an expert elicitation. So what I've done in this project is that I have reached out to experts in African biodiversity across the continent and asked them to participate in the structured elicitation process where 
essentially how the process works is that I identify a lead expert in each of the major taxonomic groups. And then I ask them to reach out to experts that are knowledgeable in African biodiversity in that group, both across the continent and elsewhere in the world. They're invited to participate and then we take them through a structured process whereby they estimate how uh, the different groups of species that they're knowledgeable in, how they are impacted by different types of human landscape change. So over the last year, we've run seven of these uh, expert elicitations. The names there are the lead experts. Half of them are women. A couple of these uh, are still in progress. Um, and, and so, so far we've had 136 experts participate in this project, uh, estimating based on their knowledge, how the groups of species that they're uh, ex experts in are impacted by different types of landscape change. So they come from 22 African countries, as well as experts that have contributed that live elsewhere uh, in the world. And this shows you the number of experts across the different taxonomic groups. So about 20 to 30 experts per species group. And we have a website now up where you can go and meet all of these experts and learn about the important work that they do, be they working for a museum, a research institution, an NGO, et cetera, in these different countries. Um, and we did quite well in terms of um, recruiting experts that had expertise across the uh, regions of sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see that there on the left. And on the right, you can see that we also did quite well, though arguably not as well as we could have in um, bringing in African-based experts. So we wanted to bring in everybody that had expertise in African biodiversity, but we also wanted to particularly seek out African experts that may not have, you know, be, have published the science papers on the topic because they actually, you know, work as field rangers or uh, in local museums, etc, but really hold the knowledge that is necessary for this project. Um, so you can see there that about three quarters of the experts that we brought into the project uh, that agreed to participate are on the African continent. Um, we do have a bias towards South African contributors compared to the rest of Africa. The rest of Africa were about a third of the experts that contributed. Now, this trend emerged, which um, I, I didn't expect. So again, to say that this is not, this project was not research into the gender of African biodiversity experts. This was just what emerged. Um, from us actively trying to seek out as many experts as we could in African biodiversity to contribute to this project. Only 20% of the experts that have contributed so far are women. And then these are the same plots, the region and the nationalities, but now I'm just showing you the proportion of women. And what you can see here is that firstly, in terms of the region of expertise, we rarely struggle to get women with expertise in Central and West Africa in particular. And you can also see here on our expert nationalities figure that it looks radically different to the one before. So if you look at that 7% there, I'll just scroll back to the other figure. So 34% of our experts in total were African experts outside of South Africa. Just 7% of the women that contributed were African experts outside of South Africa. South Africa, the representation is quite similar. And then we see the, the gap from, um, from African experts is really filled by expert, expats living on the continent as well as foreigners. So, so really we, we are lacking African, we're, we're lacking female expertise in this project and particularly African female expertise. Now, again, I am not a gender expert. This was an alarming outcome for me as a woman in science. And so I think it really, you know, raises a bunch of questions as to, to why, this, why this is. Is this representative of the proportion of female biodiversity experts across the continent? Was there something about our process that, um, prevented us reaching out to these experts, et cetera. So 
this is, I found to be a really interesting paper that I'm sure others will also talk about and, and may have read, just thinking about this leaky pipeline of women uh, in STEM. You know, women fall out at every stage, I think, of the, the career journey, right from the beginning, where they're less likely to get opportunities as graduate students or postdocs, to struggling to get grants, um, etc. But this is global research. And I would be really interested to understand whether are these leaks just worse across Africa or are there other dynamics also at play? Um, a, a few years ago uh, at, uh, on Women's Day, I asked the expert, uh, I asked the researchers at the center where I'm based, which is the Center for Sustainability Transitions in Stellenbosch uh, in South Africa, their perspectives um, on women in science. So this is the center where there is a female co-director. There are a lot of women from South Africa as well as Southern Africa in the center. And this just shows you some of their um, perspectives. And I think what comes out here quite strongly is really the importance of women role mod models um, for, for keeping women in science. And I can certainly uh, speak to that for my own um, career as well. Seeing other women that have forged the path and thrived has really uh, been useful. And then also some of the women in our center have worked overseas in places that have better uh, or more equitable parenting policies and women just re reflecting on that as well and how um, much that helps to enable uh, at, women to stay in science. So I put this question out to you um, uh, in the poll or maybe I'm not sure if the poll is now gone ahead otherwise maybe we can do it now but you know based on that leaky pipeline international uh, uh, paper, but then also what, you know, the experiences have been in South Africa. These are, I think, some of the reasons that we, you know, we really need to work on to enable more women to stay in science. But I would be very interested to hear from the experts in, uh, on this panel and your experiences from, you know, across the world and particularly those of you in Africa as to whether there's other aspects as well that we really need to work on so that um, my figure of African biodiversity experts and the contribution of women looks radically different if we were to do this again. So I'll leave it there. And yeah, thanks very much for including me in this important conversation. Thank you very much, Eli. Um, very interesting uh, research project and also very interesting res uh, results concerning women's participation. Yeah. I'm curious to see the results of the poll if it's ready. And um, there are also some, okay, let's look at this. Mm. Uh, female mentors and role model in science, 33%. Yes, equal access to education. There's still a lot of work to do. Addressing biases in selection committees for employment and grants. I yeah. agree. Supportive parental policies and others. Um, if you want to express what the other is in the question and answer, uh, feel free to do so. Um, we'll be very interested. Uh, there are a couple of questions um, related to, to your talk. Um, well, one on a more, let's not be speciesist, uh, we're talking about gender, but we're also interested in science. Um, a, a colleague asked why you're not men mentioning fish. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, we want to be inclusive also in our uh, organizations. Uh, so I could also put you in contact afterwards on this. But also another question uh, is how do you get collaborators? Uh, um, sometimes, you know, it's difficult for international yeah. research grant application. Was it hard for you? Uh, this mm -hmm. is another gender gap, which I think is is of interest if, if the must be a bias also if it's a woman when asking for expert or mm. collaborator if it's a man. So a couple of quick reaction on, on, on to that. And also Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I must say I had to I had to I got a bit of a surprise at one point reaching out to these experts across the continent and one of them responded and said, thank you, Mr. Haley, I'd love to participate. And it made me laugh because I wondered how many of these experts just assumed I was a man. <laughs> and then when we brought them all together in this introductory meeting, maybe got a pride that I was a relatively early career woman. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure if that would have influenced how many participated, but I think, you know, getting collaborators so I started kind of locally with people that I 
that I already knew within my networks and then really leveraged their networks, which I think was like a, a much more effective way of reaching out to experts than if I had tried to do it myself. These people have their own networks within their groups, species groups of expertise um, that helped the project a lot. And then I think, you know, that it's coming back to this difficulty of women maybe access, having equal access to grants. I think once I got the grant, because it's the grant has a brand and it's prestigious, that really, I think, helped people come on board they, because they, it legitimized what I was trying to do. But of course, before that, it can be more challenging. So I think, you know, starting local with the, the people that you know and, and working up from there um, can be helpful. That's that's great. It's very interesting. Um, it's, it's sometimes, you know, the name or how you present yourself in a message. And in this day and age where we don't see each other anymore, but everything is virtually, yeah. maybe this could also be an asset uh, sometimes. Yeah. But yes, getting a prestigious grant will help in getting more and in getting more, more respect. So this is a very, very good point. I I'm going to ask you to write the answer about fish uh, in the, I will, in the I will chat do. and maybe to establish a new collaboration. Who knows? <laughs> yes, it's also exactly. I'd be delighted. It's, <laughs> it's uh, and uh, I'm I'm also I see also a comment that they're not invertebrates as well and and so on. So I'm sure you'll get more collaborators after this talk and and <laughs> this is already this is already a result yeah. of the webinar and uh, the yeah. more we to put and help each other in doing wonderful research, uh, the better it is also for narrowing gender gap. Thank you so much, Eli. Thank you very much. Thanks, and Lucia. stay on because there's more question for you, I'm sure, at the end of the talk. All right. Uh, now I'm going to ask, um, yes, the fantastic comments um, that we get in it. Uh, and please do put in the question and answer uh, session, Haley, put the name of the grant and how you can apply for it. Uh, it would be helpful for everybody. Uh, I would like to ask Sarita if she's ready for a talk. Or we continue. Sarita? Um, there is a technical problem. Um, I'm so sorry about this, um, uh, but this happens. Um, so I, I would like to suggest you moving on uh, uh, with the following talk uh, by Catherine Jamy. And allow me to introduce her. Um, she's an amazing researcher. She's a senior researcher at the French National Research Council. She's trained in mathematics and in Chinese studies, and she's an historian of science. Her field of research is the circulation of scientific and technical knowledge between China and Europe in the 17th and 18th century, and the appropriation of such knowledge by Chinese imperial state. She also has an interest in the history of women in science. She's the editor of the journal uh, East Asia Science, Technology and Medicine. She's the secretary general of the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, what is usually referred to as IUFOST. This is one of the great acronym of our community. She played a driving role in the foundation of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science in 2020 and is currently its chair. If you go to our website, you also find a link to this particular uh, committee. But Catherine, it's a pleasure to have you here for the webinar and the floor is yours. Thank you, merci. Thank you, um, Lucia, for this introduction and um, uh, good morning or afternoon or evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and for me it's a particular pleasure because, uh, as Lucia has suggested, I am uh, often in conversation with colleagues from East Asia, but I see that here I have a chance to um, uh, reach out to colleagues from uh, other parts of the world with whom I seldom have opportunities to uh, interact. So next slide, please. Um, so firstly, I, I would like to um, talk about um, what got me in, um, uh, in um, you know, well, why I, 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 how I come to be here today. And this came about with my participation in a project which was actually uh, aimed at literally measuring and reducing the gender gap in science. Please, next slide. Um, next slide, please. 
um, yes. So this project ran uh, from 2017 to 2019 with funding from uh, ICSU and then the International Science Council. Um, and it was led by two scientific union, the International Mathematical Union and the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry. Um, and you can see the title, it's about measuring, but also reducing the gender gap in the whole range of um, uh, sciences. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this project achieved three um, uh, tasks. One was a survey of scientists, about above 30,000 scientists around the world um, sent responses to our uh, survey. And the conclusion that was drawn from this data is that women's experiences in both educational and employment settings are consistently less positive than men's. So in a sense, this is really quantifying what all of us feel is the case. Um, but we, you know, if we are told, oh, but your experience is only individual, we can never win with just, you know, qualitative data. So quantitative data is important. Um, similarly, there was a second uh, task that was carried out, and that was about publication, joint data-backed study on publication pattern. And the result was also to characterize a gender publication gap. Um, the result is like this. On the whole, uh, in, the, in the disciplines examined, the percentage of women author of articles in uh, scientific journals does increase with the percentage of women in science. But we see that in so-called top journals in each discipline, the gap remains wider. Um, and finally, um, we developed a database of good practices. The idea was to analyze the practices in order to provide evidence of effectiveness and impact of the practices that uh, we select and that we then make available for um, people who are looking for, you know, to implement such practices. Uh, next slide, please. So why is a project like this of interest to a historian of science? Uh, well, I should say first that my union is a member of ISC. And as I, um, uh, I regard myself also belonging to the sciences, and I have to say there is a significant and unaddressed gender gap in the discipline to which I belong, and which I represented in the Gender Gap in Science project. The second reason why I'm interested is because historical studies on women and gender in science can and do shed light on two important points, why the gender gap in science persists, and how historical and scientific discourses and practices may contribute to perpetuating it. We need to be aware of that. And last but not least, I think this project was, I would say, in itself a historical event. It's an important first because it was conducted by women and men of science rather than by science policy makers. And I think it's also the whole, uh, you know, why it's so important that it's IUBS that has started a series of webinars, meaning we are going to work from within our communities on, you know, how our institutions work to make sure that we address and redress uh, the gender biases. Uh, next slide, please. So let me give you just um, a few um, uh, reflections from a historian of science on how um, representations of science and scientists uh, inside and beyond our communities uh, com convey and perpetuate the gender gap. Next slide, please. Um, so um, in 1957, they started a series of studies that are still continued, and these are called the Draw a Scientist Test. Basically, you go into a classroom, or rather education scientists go into classroom and ask all the children there, please draw a scientist. Um, I should add that, of course, it works very well in English, in languages like French or Spanish. Um, the, the request would convey a gender in itself, so it's a bit different, but let's just limit ourselves for now to English. It's interesting enough. So um, this, this test has been uh, carried out for more than 60 years. And for example, by 1999, the perception of scientists as being male Caucasians working indoors with chemistry was still prevalent. And by 2018, just three years ago, only three in 10 children asked to draw a scientist, draw a woman. 
but that is more than ever. So it's our general impression that yes, things are improving, but it's terribly slow. And um, we are quite right in getting impatient. Next slide, please. Uh, so children are not more biased than anybody else. They just draw what they see. According to uh, uh, UNESCO uh, statistics, around 30% of scientists around the world are women. Uh, there are no data for USA and Canada, so I give you the, the figure for what it is. So for me, the, the question is, um, there is a difference between presence and visibility. Uh, and this includes not only within our field. Uh, earlier, John was mentioning the difficulty of uh, having women you know, in, in um, the uh, governing bodies of international uh, associations, but also appearance in the medias and most prize winners. Next slide, please. So if we look at um, people who were awarded Nobel Prizes and field medals up to, that, uh, up to last year, uh, and if we look at the various disciplines, uh, we can see that it's, uh, well, the, the extent varies, but it's always the same pattern. That is uh, very few women compared to the number of men. Um, and in fact, received historical narratives of scientific disciplines perpetuate a similar discrepancy um, between reality and visibility, uh, similar to the one we can see in this table. This discrepancy is both a consequence of the history of women in science. It is also a hindrance to the reduction of the gender gap in science today. Next slide, please. So one task that we all share, but I, th I think that is really uh, incumbent upon historians of science is to make women visible. And this is true for science. It's true for everywhere else in society. Next slide, please. So uh, since we saw children drawing scientists as chemists, let me take the history of chemistry. And I will just have, have something that we would call a receive uh, historical narrative of science. I've taken the Wikipedia article uh, on history of chemistry. And I've looked again at images, right? I can find 23 sign, uh, chemists portrayed in there. Um, and among those 23, there are 21 men and two women. Now let us see how these two women are depicted. Next slide, please. So first we find a portrait of Monsieur Lavoisier and his wife, woman number one. Secondly, we find, if we look very closely, that in the first Solvay conference held in Brussels in 1911, there was one woman among, um, as you can see, quite a few men. Next slide, please. Now, who are these women? Um, the first one is Marianne Paulze Lavoisier, who, besides being uh, Monsieur Lavoisier's wife, was also a chemist in her own uh, right. The other one is Mary Skłodowska Curie. I think we all know about her, uh, but she had to win two Nobel Prizes, not just one, in order to, uh, uh, you know, be the woman scientist that everybody uh, uh, refers to. Um, now, next slide, please. So, can we do better than this? Because what I'm doing now is I'm spotting the few women on lists that record the memory of science. And these women are a few, mostly white women in a crowd of mostly white men. Um, now, I'm not criticizing chemistry because other disciplines do not fare better. I'm not criticizing Wikipedia either. Wikipedia has a wiki project called Women in Red, the purpose of which is to create more entry on women in it. So as we all know, Wikipedia is what we make it. Um, but I would propose uh, more broadly to look at science, not as a series of heroic achievement or of individual geniuses, but as a complex body of knowledge constructed by communities. And I think that all those presents here, those who are taking part in the Congress of Zoologists would all agree with me that this is really what science is when we are making it, uh, as opposed to when we are uh, looking at, uh, at it from a distance. So how can we do this? And I would like to um, just mention one, in my view, quite successful uh, attempt at um, looking at science in this way. Next slide, please. Um, two years ago, there was the International Year for the Periodic Table. And uh, on this occasion, two uh, colleague historians of science, whose name you can see on the screen, uh, organized a conference and then edited a volume called Women in Their Element. 
selected women's contributions to the periodic system. Next slide, please. Um, in this book, just a table of contents give you more than 40 names of women who contributed to the periodic table since the 18th century. And these women include Madame Lavoisier and Marie Curie, but also many others whose names are not recorded in more traditional histories of chemistry. So the whole point is this, women are there, they have been there all along in science, but you just need to look elsewhere than in the uh, Hall of Fame records. Next slide, please. So um, in conclusion, I would say it is important that women scientists should be given visibility individually and collectively. Um, and women scientists also, they have long been too many to list. We should therefore continue to collect data on their careers, publications and experiences. And uh, last but not least, I think that sharing both data and experiences as well as good practices across disciplines is really crucial as we strive to reduce gender gaps. Last, the next slide, please. Um, and so this is what the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science has endeavored to do. Uh, it now has 18, um, it groups 18 partners, most of which are scientific unions under ISC. And um, of course, one reason why I'm here today is because the International Union of Biological Sciences is a partner of that committee. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Catherine. And I think we can launch the question and the poll now. I always find very fascinating uh, Catherine's talk about finding women in different photos and in different situations. All right, we have the results. So do you think the visibility of women zoologists matches their actual presence in the discipline and contribution to it within the profession? 77, no, wow. Well, do you think the visibility of women zoologists matches their actual presence in the discipline and contribution to it in public media? 86% no. Uh, I, uh, all right, I don't think we are surprised um, about, about this, but it's, it's very telling how much the difference is. Catherine, would you like to, to comment on it? Yes, well, I, I, I think so. That means there is quite a bit of work to do on that. Just, you know, when women are there, we must really find ways of making them uh, visible, being, you know, inside communities, or I think even more importantly, uh, uh, in, in, in public media, because I think it's one of the, uh, we, I mean, as professional scientists, we are not able to, I would say, um, change societies at large, but what we can do is by making women scientists visible outside science to the broader society, uh, send a message to little girls saying, yes, this is something you could be later, and um, also to their parents, to their teachers, etc. So I think this is really a crucial, um, a, you know, a crucial issue and that we can do something about it because making them visible inside the profession will also um, you know, help making them visible um, in media and more widely. Yeah, thanks. And I have I've seen the questions that are coming through through the systems, and in particular, uh, I request to share materials uh, on this on on the gender gaps. And uh, Kathleen, would you like to highlight a little bit the the book and the maybe the journal issues that are coming out of? Of, of the gender gap project and where they can be found? Um, yes, I will put the, um, I think I will put the links to the gender gap uh, in, in, in the chat when j just uh, in a few moments, but uh, yes, this book is available. You can download it um, uh, for free. And um, there has been also published in uh, earlier this year, a special issue of the journal Pure and Applied Chemistry. So that's the contribution of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Um, and I think even, you know, an event like this is also an outcome of the uh, gender gap. So I think various unions are taking initiatives and the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science is also going to start its webinar. So I think there is now a, a you know, a, a great um, variety of initiatives and I think one of the things that our standing committee will do is to advertise them 
on a single web page that people can um, can see uh, where to go and what's happening so we can we can really um, have an idea of how varied this is. Fantastic. And, and there is a question, a specific question, how to become a member of this committee? Um, so the committee is not a committee of which individuals are members. This is something that brings together international unions. So unions are themselves federations of national uh, uh, committees or societies. Um, and I, I should say that although I find that, of course, association and individual membership groups are important, the reason why um, the standing committee, I think the, 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 the added value is that in international unions, one country, one vote, uh, whereas in many fields, at least in mine, international association tend to be very, very centered on the North American continent with a bit of Western Europe, whereas um, I think it's really good when each African country has one vote and each uh, Asian country has one vote because this is more what the world is like, right? So um, this uh, committee doesn't have individual membership, but please, you can contact us by email and we can keep you uh, informed of what is going on and, uh, um, you know, pass on uh, information. And you can yeah. pass on information to us too. And, and also, allow me to say, you can reach out to your union if you belong to one, or if you see that your union is not represented, now taking action on gender equality, maybe you could be the catalyzer of a new, uh, a new member of the, of the committee in the future. Um, and also remembers that unions are international, but they're also association at the national level, and so you could be involved at, at the national level as well, and shaking up maybe where the gender equality issue or the diversity issue uh, is, not, is not addressed. So please do reach out and, and also reach out to people who never thought about this. Uh, there is another interesting point in one question, if I may, Catherine. I know you're, you're, uh, um, you're very interested to find different viewpoints also in your research on where, where female scientists are. And there is a colleague in the Philippines that talks about uh, the mentioning in science textbook. There are not many female scientists mentioned in science textbook. So it'd be interesting. It'd be an interesting project or, or maybe even a webinar to discuss this uh, because a textbook is what will imprint the way uh, you, you look at science, uh, the fact, uh, you know, just on a personal uh, slant, but the fact they call Lucy the Australopithecus and I was called Lucilla, that drew my attention to that field. So uh, I think it would be interesting to look at that. Anyway, thank you so much, Catherine, for your interesting talk. Um, it is always a pleasure to, to listen to you and learning new things. Thank you. And congratulations to the group as well. Thank you. All right, uh, and there are many questions, so I invite all the speakers to also to to answer to some of them on the on the question and answer. I'm asking, I'm just double checking if Sarita is back online, or if not. We are going to listen to Renuka Bade. I apologize if I if I pronounce name with a very thick Italian accent, but that was made not a problem. Webinar. Very close <laughs> webinar global in this way, right? Um, all right, we talked about in the Catherine Jamie uh, um, talk about Wikipedia, and that links very well also uh, to your presentation and to the work that your community is doing. So allow me to first. So tell me how you say your last name so we could all... Uh... You were very close. There's okay. uh, there's a sound in there that doesn't exist in European languages. Ah, okay, so okay. It's very difficult to pronounce, but I can introduce myself. My name Fantastic. is Jim Bade. Okay, so she currently serves as the Executive Secretary of the European Polar Board based in the Netherlands. She has previously worked with the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, SCAR, and currently serve on their Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Scoping Group. Uh, she has an amazing educational background in economics, public policy, and Southern Ocean phytoplankton physiology. Uh, she's worked a lot on the science policy interface and 
on issues related to equality, diversity, and inclusion. She's a passionate advocate for diversity in polar research and has co-founded the Women in Polar Science Network in 2014 to alight and promote women working in all aspects of polar research, particularly as a spoken advocate for members and of underrepresented communities. She has mentored countless of early researchers uh, globally and was awarded the 2017 Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, APEX, International Mentorship Award. She promotes polar research to a wide variety of stakeholders using a range of traditional and non-traditional communication tools to ensure that the message uh, reaches the audience in the best possible manner. And I'm so pleased to have you here to speak at our webinar today. And I also would like to thank the SCAR Executive Director and all the SCAR uh, Secretariat for allowing us to get in touch with you. Thank you, Renuka, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction to me. Uh, please bear with me for a second while I share my screen. So um, uh, Lucilla already said this, but I just wanted to thank everyone from SCAR and also the community here that you want to listen to our experiences from the polar regions. So my, my speech today will be about barriers to diversity, uh, both real and perceived. And I will talk about mainly about my own experiences from the polar regions, but also some collected uh, intelligence over the years. Um, I do currently serve as the executive secretary of the European Polar Board, like Lucilla said, but today I'm speaking to you as co-founder of the Women in Polar Science Network. I will close this talk. So the latter half of my talk will be, will be quite a few questions. Um, and those questions I hope will raise issues that uh, both the IUBS and also the community in general tend uh, continue to think about. So I was invited um, a few weeks ago to give this, to give this talk and I went through the IUBS website. Um, the first thing I saw in there was the header statement. IUBS acknowledges that women have long been disadvantaged in the pursuit, pursuit of bioscience. Now the first step to changing something is always, always to acknowledge um, that there is a problem and that problem exists. And I was super, super happy to see that such, an headline, such a headline statement existed on the IUBS website. However, when we look at the photo of the executive committee members, there's a lot of comments like, why did no or so few women nominate themselves for a position on the executive committee of the IUBS? There are so many people who are very well-meaning, but by saying or questioning things like that and putting the, putting the onus on women, they, they kind of express surprise that women don't nominate themselves for high level position on board. This really underlines the lack of um, knowledge of all the structural conscious and unconscious biases that exists right from primary school for women. Uh, against women taking up science subjects right from the beginning. So Catherine spoke about the Picture a Scientist uh, project, and I'm glad I didn't include it in my presentation, otherwise it would have been a complete repetition, but I have another example in there. These kind of biases and social conditioning happen from a very young age, four to six years of age, and they continue through the ages and affect women through their life. Now imagine that you're competing against someone who's carrying that baggage already. So, you know, you have to take that. Everyone has to take that into account. How do we, what else are we looking at? We are looking at the fact that there are few women at higher career stages. And there are more invitations to these few women just to showcase the diversity in that com community. So, the few women that are there are stretched particularly thin. Women also in general tend to bear a higher burden of things that are non-recognized academically. 
things like mentoring, administrative work, and it's collectively known as a, something that super annoys me, office housework. Um, women are also judged very differently to men. Women are considered on a likability scale, whereas men are considered on a capability scale. So if I today raise some very strong points, you may not like me and you will never ever invite me again. Whether I'm capable or not doesn't come into the question at all. And this, these are kind of implicit biases that we really need to keep in mind that work against women and also against other minority communities, not just women. So why do we want diversity? This is another question that I've heard quite, quite a lot. Shouldn't we look at the best science? You know, we, we want the best science. We don't, we, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to look at things like, uh, oh, uh, maybe we should have quotas or we should have something, you know, we should ensure that more women are part of science. So what happens? There was a really nice, um, very nice example from, from the biological sciences uh, about this. We know that researchers of different genders and backgrounds contribute very greatly to the diversity of questions and approaches uh, in science. The example that I've given there in that paper is about bird song, which was historically studied primarily as a male trait. However, as female researchers started coming into this, this field, they realized that birdsong isn't just a male bird trait, that there are a lot of female birds that are also likely to produce birdsong. In addition to that, women are actually more likely than men to be authors and even first authors on papers about female birdsong. So it really is largely women who have reshaped this classical field of study. And so this is, this is similar and this kind of spans different uh, research disciplines as well. So it's, it's not just about, about birdsong, but also female authors tend to publish more often with women co-authors and therefore opening doors to greater funding and more opportunities to more women in science. So it, it kind of, it, it's a chain reaction that happens. Where do we really start looking? Um, there are so many different aspects to, to biosciences. It is very, very difficult to consider biosciences as a monolith. There are different fieldwork-based subjects. There are laboratory-based subjects. There are different topics that we learn in school and higher education. There are so many fields within, within biosciences. We have plant or animal sciences, marine biology, biotechnology, and so on and so forth. I've only included a very, very small number of fields here. But we have to remember that it's not, biosciences is not a monolith. And it's the same concept about identities as well. Being a woman is not a monolith. Being a woman isn't the only thing that defines me. There's, so the, he, in this slide, you'll find just a few ways of defining who I am. And that really matters because how people perceive me will directly affect my experience within, within that place. For example, do I appear as a young woman in, a, in an academic conference? I've been blessed with Asian skin, so I don't look my age, which is nearly 50. So people often mistake me as a PhD student, and that really affects my experience because when I speak with experience, people don't take that seriously. So it, it really has a very direct effect. Does me being non-white make my experience, experience different? How do all of these different aspects affect people's perception of me? It's very well and good to start with just gender and to work to increase women's representation in biosciences. But unless we start including, uh, looking at inclusivity as a whole and taking intersectionality into account, the practices that are put in place will get outdated very, very quickly. And I've, I really like the, I think almost the very first question that popped up into the Q&A box and I've copied it in there is we are not looking at this just from a binary point of view. To look at women and their 
issues is just the start. And we are definitely, you know, there's efforts out there that are, that are not just for women, that are for looking at all these different, different identities that I was speaking about. So, um, how do we, uh, we go now into the polar world. Efforts to improve gender, gender equality have, um, have evolved in various ways across the world. Uh, the first thing that happened within the polar world was that it was considered a very masculine field. Um, it was considered as, you know, heroic men, adventurous men were needed, strong men were needed. Um, and the advertisement on the right was the one placed by Shackleton for his famous trip to the Antarctic. You'll be surprised to hear that women from many countries were barred from polar research well into the 1990s. So it's, it's a very recent thing. Formal barri barriers still persist for some women. So for example, if they are within the LGBTQ uh, spectrum, they will have issues. Women with disabilities may be barred from field work. So how can we better our professional networks and societies? To affect any structural change, we need to know what the baseline is. So the collection of data is paramount. And this data also needs to be desegregated. So for this, we know that women of color and LGBTQ women are disproportionately affected by harassment compared to other women. There's also a lot of informal barriers that persist, including caring responsibilities and unpaid work. There's cultural sexism, there's gender bias, there's lack of opportunities and, and recognition. And there's also unwanted attention and harassment. This is a shocking piece of research for me where 71% of women uh, recorded harassment and 28% of women recorded sexual assault in the survey of academic field experiences. This is something that we really need to have policies in place to protect members of our communities from these kinds of assault. And we should consider the diversity and inclusion initiatives and, and we should ensure that these kind of policies that are in place have to center on intersectionality, all the various identities of a person. How are we working to recognize the excellence of women? Women are known to be less likely to win awards. And I think this point has been covered by a lot of the speakers before me. We can change the wording. SCAR and other polar research organizations tried this very simple change of wording on their, on their advertisement for uh, nominations of awards. And they actually found a really solid difference. We also have to ensure that di geographical diversity is represented within the awardees as well. What are we doing to inspire the next generation? Again, this for this, we really have to break the gender and race stereotypes. And both of them exist, existed very strongly in the Antarctic and still continue to exist today. This is just a photo of, of the first women that landed on the South Pole and all six of them linked hands when they got down from the airplane so that not one of them would be a single person to reach, single woman to reach the pole first, but all six of them. So these are amazing uh, role models to have. We had a comment about the Wikipedia page uh, or Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Women in Red, um, we had, we had a big event in one of the conferences held by, by SCAR. And to date, polar science is the only science that I know of where women are more represented on Wikipedia than men are and by quite a large factor. The other, the, one of the last things I wanted to ask you was, do you believe where the gender bias exists? Because if you don't believe it, you still have a lot of implicit biases. And this is shown by the little simple test that was uh, shown by Catherine about drawing a scientist. You associate a man with science. There's also very strong, um, there's also very strong e experience from 
women who are not white that they have to provide more experience of uh, competence to prove themselves to others. Some women, uh, they're pressured to play a stereotypically feminine role. I have been asked countless times, I didn't expect an Indian and a woman to be working in polar science. Well, why not? You know, why is that a problem? If I'm capable of it, I work in it. And how are we working to retrain, retain researchers in this field? I think a lot of people, a lot of the speakers prior to me have spoken about this. So I'll probably skip over the slide a little bit, but I think we really have to think very hard about which, which, which levels are those where women are lost and why and when. And I leave you with this little identities graph to, for you to think a little bit more about, you know, are you just a woman? Are you just a man? Are you um, non, non-binary? And what other kind of identities do you identify with? And then we can start working on changing the world together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Renuka. This is very, very interesting. I'm glad you brought up the question, the first question that was um, put on the question and answer box at the beginning, and we are going to pick it up on that uh, later in the discussion uh, session. Um, any question for the audience? Uh, uh, Lucilla, can I launch yeah. the audience poll? Yes, please. So what describe you best? Executive committee, working groups, or other decision-making or influence in body in a UBS? Executive committee, working group, or other decision-making or influence body in your own organization? I don't have a work role with active decision-making or influencing aspects. Let me say a couple of sentences about why I asked this question. Great, thanks. It's because if we want to institute structural change, we need to be talking to the people who can make that change. And a lot of times in these kind of, um, in these kind of webinars, I have seen that we tend to talk to the converted. I'm really happy mm. to see that there's more than 5% of the audience which are not identifying as women, for example. Otherwise, we are just talking to women about issues that they know and they experience on a daily basis. So this is why I asked this question about whether you have the ability to make this structural change. And this is the, re the real audience that we need to tap and educate and link with. Yes. Can we see the, the results if they're ready? I'm curious. Aha, uh -huh. okay. It's good. It's uh, the majority, 57%. I do not have a work role with active decision making or influence aspect. I hope that by the end of the webinar series, um, those of you who have clicked that maybe will have some uh, decision making or influencing, uh, or influencing aspect in your, uh, in your portfolio as well by reaching well, out also I, to different committee. Uh, and sometimes you don't need a role. You just need the right ideas to do that. Yeah. And I think, I think this also underlines the fact that we need to reach out to these people more um, to ensure that they also attend, the ones in power attend, people on the executive committee of IUBS or all of the working groups have to be invited to attend and have to be told that it is super important for you to attend to understand the issues there. Yes, and allow me to, to thank the IUBS executive director uh, for advertising uh, the webinar widely, as well as our colleague at India Bioscience, India Biostreams, for making sure that we reach to different communities on this. There are many questions, and um, I, I like to, to choose one because uh, I've been puzzling myself over the issue about the likability, likability for women and capability uh, for men. Um, is that type of perception coming mainly from men or women too? I would like you to give you another few seconds to highlight about the fact that it's not just men 
who apply stereotypes on women, but maybe yeah. also women. No, apply? absolutely. Everyone applies that stereotype. It's an implicit bias. It's an unconscious bias. You don't know that you're doing it. I may be doing it sometimes. I have no clue but I have to get myself educated. There's a really simple test hmm. called the Harvard Implicit okay. Bias Test. And if you take that, you will be surprised. People working on gender studies fail that test. So I'll put yes. a link in the, in the Q&A box or in the chat box, wherever is uh, relevant. Please yeah. do, I, I, I encourage you to take that test because it I, just shows that yeah. we, we associate something with gender very very strongly and it's it's kind of rammed into us right from the time that we are tiny children so it's very difficult to kind of get rid of that issue but as we start educating ourselves then we will slowly get rid of it I took it um, and uh, after reading the fantastic book that I recommend to everybody what works on gender equality by Iris Bonnet and uh, from Harvard Kennedy School and uh, I took the test and I'm biased. I only see women yeah. scientists. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, so you'll be surprised. I was just exposed by the time, at that time, of the, all the activity of the SCAR on, uh, on women. And actually, I cannot picture uh, a man polar scientist. And actually, this is not a particularly, you know, good things on me, but... Yeah. It's a, it's a it's a bias that I have to be to be aware, aware of, of. Yeah. and uh, we promise that we try to get uh, also more men in this uh, in this webinar as well. And, but we'll try harder next time. But I see that in the audience we achieved a little bit more than than we expected. So we will ask for everybody, and for sure, the binary concept uh, it was used just a working concept for this particular webinar, but we're gonna have probably a very important discussion on intersectionality, which is a strange word that is a buzzword in the gender studies, but it should become more and more used in, in, the, in the sciences while looking at uh, gender gaps and inclusion diversity um, context. So thank you so much, Renuka. This is fantastic. I congratulate to SCAR and to all the other organizations. They've been working on this for many years now. So we have a lot to learn as well. I'm sure the president of RUBS who's listening carefully, uh, Professor Shashidara will probably maybe reach out to you and, and, and maybe look at different issues that can be learned from SCAR as well and, and having a conversation since you comment on the website. Absolutely. Um, Thank you I'm very much, to Renuka. Thank you. And thank you, SCAR Executive Director. Um, we hope also to have you on board of the next webinars. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just uh, give the floor back to John uh, for, ooh, he's also moved there, I think. Um, <laughs> I love all these different backgrounds. John, I leave the floor to you to check with Sarita if she can uh, connect or will open the uh, question and answer. We have lots of questions to, to address anyhow. Yes, I, I, I've been trying to contact Sarita and so is Natalie. So we have been unable to do so. So we must assume she's not going to be with us. But I'd like to raise one quick question, if I may. Um, and that is that uh, Renuka mentioned uh, self-nomination. And it, in general, a lot of these uh, societies and unions aren't awfully enthusiastic about self-nomination. What we need to do is rather than self-nominate, it's to get uh, the nominating bodies that actually nominate through to the unions and the societies to actively seek out. And your, um, your statement about men wanted, I think, Obviously, you really mean women wanted, and that's the ideal thing to get through and get societies, national societies and so on, to think seriously about women getting nominated so they can go through these issues. By the time we have our General Assembly, it's too late um, because the nominations are all through and we, we've found that. There's one other minor thing I would like to mention. I have in the past run a series of out outreach um, schools for young Aboriginals, and uh, we had a, a very promising one in the Northern Territory a few years ago, and there was one young young uh, woman there who was outstanding. And I, I said to her, look, why don't you choose biology as a, as a career? 
And she said, oh no, she said, I'm not going to be a scientist. I want to be a lawyer so I can make a difference in the world. So I leave you with that thought, which is a bit scary, but nonetheless, um, we need to be able to find um, systems and mechanisms to, to get young women enthusiastic about leadership roles in science. Now, Sarita, anything there? No. Now, um, I, I assume we're going to have to leave Sarita behind here um, and uh, move to some of the questions. Now, Suchi, you, you've got some questions there for us to look at. Uh, yes, John, uh, there are two audience polls for you and Lucilla. So I'll launch the first one for you. So do you think a quota system in international committees and boards is appropriate? Uh, chat box is open for all now in case they want to use the chat box for this poll. Now they can fill it in straight with that um, poll, can't they, as, as per normal? Yeah, good. Yes. <clears throat> it's a pity we can't vote. Okay, so she, we should probably have had enough time for people to make their decisions there. Can we have? My goodness. Um, so there's a pretty strong two thirds almost um, agreement that a, a quota system is useful. Um, <coughs> now in the chat, I can't see down there where I can read any particular comments about that. Do you think a quota system in scientific leadership in university is appropriate? Almost the same. Um, so it's a very positive um, endorsement of a quota system. So thank you for that. I've just had an, a, a chat comment from um, Sarita. She will be able to talk and give us a few of her perspectives in about four minutes. So um, could we go into the next question, please, Suchi? Yes, the next poll is about... So this is the, the main gender gap we addressed. Yes, um, it, it's, yeah. it's about, thank you, uh, very interesting results on the quota. And this is something that we will explore further, maybe through also a dedicated webinar, because there are pros and cons in applying quotas or applying quota for a longer time than the, or, or for a short time. But here, yeah, really, we would like to, to know, as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, what are the main gender gaps? I like the S, sorry, to be addressed and discussed by the IUBS webinar series on gender gaps and biological sciences. Um, and here you could, uh, sorry, it, it, give him, it gives me the things in my own language, but uh, <laughs> funny. Uh, but you could choose salary, promotion, publication, funding, committee membership, or other. If you want to put other ideas, feel free to use the chat as before. And the second uh, question is really about shaping up, further shaping up the work of the working group on gender equality in order that they could really make transformative actions in a UBS is already making good progress and, and raising awareness and reaching out to the membership of IUBS. But there's so many other things that we could, uh, we could do, but also in terms of prioritizing our work. Um, and then, I think it's going to be very interesting to, to see what, what you think about it. And maybe if you also want to outreach to us and, and work together, we could also explore that. Okay, we have the results. I couldn't read it. Uh, Sushi, sorry, I'm slow. Can you put it back on the screen? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, it's very, very interesting. So one of, one of the first 67% uh, uh, and, and John, this is very interesting also for what we were discussing on the quota is the committee membership. Um, sorry, can you, keep, can you keep the poll a little bit longer? And, uh, and then we have funding, publications, promotion are quite high and, and, and salary. Uh, for those who put other, can you please say something in the chat so we could also take into account? And uh, one of the issues uh, concerning the working group is gender gaps in leadership and gender gaps in opportunities. Okay. 
uh, but also there is uh, gender and stereotypes that we just discussed with Renuka a little bit, so that could be taken uh, taken up as well. We'll take into account, uh, I'm sure, Indian Biosciences Biostreams is collecting all this information, and so we can get back to you in order to schedule also the next webinar and next activities on this particular um, uh, issue. Thank you very much. This, this, I'm sure John will agree. This helps a lot uh, with, with what we need to do next. John, do you want to make some comments on it? Yes, um, I'm particularly interested in the publications one. And the reason for that is that there was a comment made before. I think it may have been Haley who made it. Maybe it was Catherine. I can't Catherine. remember. But, um, about the fact that uh, women are less likely to, to find themselves as authors in leading journals. Um, there is now a trend, fortunately, for double-blind refereeing. And although in many cases, if it's a small field, you probably will be able to work out who the author is or authors are. Um, it is a positive trend, and I think it's one that uh, should hopefully address this imbalance. So, um, as to, as to the other big one on this list here, committee memberships. I think we need to strongly lobby our national societies and international societies that feed through to the unions just to reinforce how much we really want uh, women to be represented at the highest possible levels. The message isn't getting across and uh, it's, it's gotta be from both men and women. Um, and if we push hard enough, it will change, but it does need to change. And soon. Um, Sarita, are you there yet? John, I'm here. I'm ah. just transferring what I have to speak on from an... Um, some interviews I did earlier this year with South Africans just about the problems that they're experiencing. I will very briefly reflect on the ICC and um, just from what I can remember because that laptop has died, but I promise to, to put a nice report in, in collaboration with the committee, maybe put it on the website or discuss it at another time. I won't be able to remember all the numbers, but if you could take one or two more questions, then that would be great for me. Okay. John? Um, John? I, I'm just uh, doing a quick check. Um, is there anything else, Suchi, that we, we can put up? Is... I have a I have a question, John. Good, good. Actually, I have a question for somebody, if I may. <laughs> I'm gonna catch him a bit on the spot, but I, I would like to uh, to invite Professor Shashidara, the president of IUBS, to to comment on uh, on, on this last discussion about focus of, of different activities of the gender, uh, of the working group on gender equality of IUBS. He's been a major catalyzer in, in this context as well. So I just to have a quick reaction from him. I'm sorry, I haven't uh, sent you a message before on this, but uh, um, it'd be great if you could give some, 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 some of your views on, on this. Thanks. Thanks, Lex Uchida. So, uh... Well, I mean, uh, it's not just IUBS alone. Any organization has to look for itself and for its community. IUBS sort of represents the, the biological community of the globe. And we have more than 35 national members. And we continuously want to sort of engage with our national members and see how what they are doing related to uh, the problem of gender gap and how the whatever the interventions they are uh, you know, they're introducing and what's the impact of that. And then share that with across the other members so that each of us can learn from others, right? What's uh, the interventional, you know, uh, efforts that, you know, USA is doing or any country in Europe or 
you know, North America, South, uh, in Asia and other places. So that's one way, uh, you know, continuously sort of making the people or the countries and the organization aware of the problem. And the second one is, of course, you know, joining hands with the, the other international unions working on uh, gender gap and in, in very different disciplines of science and trying to understand the cause and, and try to innovate on the solutions. This is the work in progress. Right? And so we are still working on it. And this particular working group of IUBS itself is an outcome of such kind of efforts, say, in trying to sort of work out very different ways we can bring in some new ideas, innovations in bridging the gap. Yeah, there are no specific answer as of now because it's still work in progress. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm sure that this, this webinar series will provide uh, new ideas on uh, on how to to accelerate because let's remember sustainable development goal number five is due on 2030 and time is ticking um, and IUBS I'm sure is going to be a great catalyzer towards that achievement we cannot fail at this point all right uh, Sarita It seems we've got a problem again. Yeah, the, uh, it's a, such a shame. Um, but let's maybe we could uh, look at other questions. Um, so, Chi, do we have we have another question there? Don't we? I think. Um, uh, no. no, John. Poll questions are over, uh, but you can take questions from the Q and A box now. And maybe we can invite all the speakers to turn on their videos and to join the question and answer session. While we're waiting for that to happen, I, I just, in a sort of um, a quirk of humor, perhaps, I, I, I wonder about the concept of the scientist. Um, a lot of young children seem to think that scientists are mad. And uh, maybe that's, that's not what we want to, to encourage kids to think. But uh, mad scientists about to destroy the world is um, often what you, you see based upon the sort of cartoons that children see. So maybe leave, leave that concept with an, an association with males and develop a new concept for scientists, perhaps being more positive to, to save the environment. And we can make sure out of that. Right, Catherine, are you there? Yes, I'm there, but the moderator has switched off my video, so I may not switch it back on myself. So please, oh. thank you, great. Hi, Haley, I can see you there. Good, excellent. Right, so we are, we are all here. If there are questions that crop up in the chat line, we can certainly address those now. There is a there is a question uh, very interesting on uh, um, still on committees uh, and in particular of society and and journals. So uh, how does a society or journal recruit more women to the executive committee and journal editorial boards when the highest level of women are overstretched and over commitment over committed? How can we involve more early career sci scientist women? Um, so I would like to uh, just to uh, maybe take this opportunity to to ask uh, other uh, you, John, maybe to describe how the nomination in IUBS is done. Sometimes we don't even know how these things process, and unless somebody convinces to nominate us or to self-nominate, we're not even aware. Women don't even aware how this work. Um, for, for journal editorial boards, I have to say on my experience, I've been nominated uh, to journal editorial boards by men, uh, not by other women. So that's already uh, something to take into account. But can you explain a little bit how the nomination works? And maybe we could double check with SCAR how, you know, with the SCAR community, how their nomination nomination works, because this is a key issue that I think has been cropped up 
and IUFOST maybe could, could also comment on this. Well, regarding IUBS, uh, Natalie just sent me through a quick comment, which uh, reinforces the view that I've had. And that is that um, the last nominations committee was actually uh, chaired by a woman. Um, uh, it didn't make a difference. There were, there were um, two women and three men in the committee itself. Now, what happens is that we, we call for nominations and uh, this goes out to academies and societies uh, around the world. And um, even with uh, at least two women and chaired by a woman, it didn't make any difference. We ended up just by having, having the one uh, woman on the, on the executive board. So I think it, it means we've got to go right back. Um, it's by the time, as I said before, by the time it gets to the unions, it's too late. Uh, and even if if we loaded up the um, executive, the, the nominations committee and it had 100% female or women, it wouldn't make any difference if all the nominations are men. Now, I have a couple of comments here. Uh, Catherine, you have your hand up. Would you like to add something and then uh, remove that? Um, yes, thank you. I think that um, quota on committees and... Um, absence of bias are two separate matters because we should not be saying that women are not biased, right? This is not about men being sexist and women being good. Biases are very often unconscious, right? A part of our education there. We, we, we all have them. And so there are also, um, I mean, this has been addressed. How can you um, also, you know, train yourself to um, step back and not just follow, um, follow the sort of instinct, you know, there is, I think instincts are very much educated in hu human beings in society. So I, I think we should, uh, I want to emphasize the fact that, um, you know, having, let's say, a good representation of both, uh, of, of both or more genders on committees is an important issue, but it's more about visibility. It's not because um, enough women will make the committee virtuous as to the biases. Uh, Thanks, Thank Catherine. you. Thanks, uh, Catherine. Uh, maybe I take up the uh, response, John, if you don't mind. Good. Um, I think what you were saying, and I think I completely agree with Catherine. Um, I think you could see I was nodding along furiously as when she was speaking. Um, just because once your committee did not uh, get enough nominations from women, and if just once that committee had female members and was chaired by a woman. That's just one incident in, what, 100 years of IUBS history. Structural change doesn't happen overnight. Structural change takes years and years and years of knocking at it continuously, like a drop falling on a stone. It, it, it takes much more effort than just a few committees here and there. You have to attack the situation with you know, making sure information is available to everyone, that information is palatable and readable for everyone, making sure that that kind of information is maybe available in different languages if you want to really ensure geographical diversity, making sure that your, um, your committee is aware of implicit bias, of unconscious bias when they're making decisions, making sure that you have a nomination committee that supports nomination of people from different places, open up self-nominations. Why, why isn't that one part, one tool in your kit, kit? It doesn't need to be the only tool. You can have that as one tool in your kit. So there's so many different ways to attack this. It's this not just one, one thing kind of beats everything. It's not the one ring to rule them all, but you do have, you know, you have to have patience. This will take time. And if it doesn't work once, it doesn't mean it's not going to work ever. And uh, if, if I may add, the system approach is, is very, very interesting. Um, and sometimes there are some bruises in it. Um, and uh, I'm not going to dwell in, on this, but there's sometimes it's not hard for the people who are pushing. And, and in this context, I would like to, to call on, on Natalie from Poix, from the Secretariat. She's the executive director of the Secretariat at UBS. 
she's the one who sees which nomination comes in, which nomination doesn't come in, and and trying to pull the uh, the different documents together. So she's at the front line of trying to get a good base then for for establishing committee, and she guides on the different application for conference grant to see if there is, uh, you know, gender balance and so on. Natalie, would you like to, to add something? I know everything, um, all the detailed information are given on the website, but maybe you could give us some insight on how difficult it is sometimes to, yeah, to reach the gender I, balance. Yeah, exactly. I would like to come back to the processes of, of nominations because we send uh, all the applications to our members and this is done several times and after the role of the nomination committee is to uh, seek for more gender balance geographic balance discipline balance this is really something that is uh, highlighted even in the statutes and uh, the diversity so you can put everything under diversity but this is something that is uh, in our statutes and I utterly agree that uh, women also have a bias and we cannot uh, prevent us sometimes from acting uh, according to that. And, uh, but we really seek for a female nomination last time and it was really difficult. And, uh, and that's why actually that was a resolution also of the IUBS General Assembly that this would be really an effort to be made next time for the nomination to seek for more uh, female scientists to have this uh, leading role in the executive. And following also this uh, General Assembly, we had also new rules to support uh, conferences and also young scientists grant in IUBS. And we also asked now for a uh, gender balance to have women involved as uh, plenary speakers in the organization committee also because apparently it shows that if you have women in uh, the committee uh, like the organizing committee the scientific committee it could help to have also female speaking in these uh, conferences and for the young scientists that are invited we ask the to support uh, an equal number of male and female scientists to be sure that uh, it is really open. And this is one of the, the criteria to select uh, the, uh, the, the, the awardees of, the, of the, the grant. Thank you. So uh, if I can add a little bit to the, what Natalie mentioned, there's another couple of uh, initiatives could be uh, nudging. And the nudging comes uh, not necessarily keep on saying that, you know, nominate more women uh, members. It's also sort of ask them to sort of introspect in a, in a, you know, in a direct or indirect way. For example, um, you know, sort of ask them to sort of, you know, justify why they couldn't nominate, right? In case they did nominate. And you know, so for example, we didn't have, we don't have that many women scientists in this area or this one. They have to give some reasons. If they have to give reasons, they will actually be more aware of it and, and they look at around themselves. Many times they don't even look around. They simply they close their eyes and the two names that comes to their mind, you know, they put that uh, on paper and invariably it could be men. So I think we need to, I mean, it's true for, you know, many places. I sort of make them consciously aware of it. Uh, and sort of look around and consciously again, and rather than simply go with certain prejudices and biases. You don't have to even you know, use a magnifying lens to search. It's, they are there. It's just that people don't you know, look around and think about the, the fact that they have to not meet. Yeah, very important point. Um, I'm sure Haley now she's going to get lots of a request from women scientists to collaborate on the project. We hope so, at least, and uh, and and maybe we could help her to find other experts in in that concept to rebalance the things. I'm gonna time is uh, going away very fast, and I'm giving the floor back to John, uh, who's now putting uh, penguins on his background. Uh, very interesting gender related species as well.
Uh, your audio is off, uh, John. You were on mute. John, the microphone. I fixed Thanks. it. Yeah. The reason why the penguins are there is because Lucia said that she hadn't or she couldn't imagine a male or gentleman or male or man working in the Antarctic. So there we are. Um, I'd like to thank at this stage, first of all, and in one sense, we are children of the pandemic because we've survived and we've learned how to use this remarkable system. Uh, two or three years ago, this probably would never have happened, but now we seem to have come of age and we know how to use these systems, these wonderful systems. And I'm always in awe of how remarkable they are that we can talk all around the world and have these get togethers like this. I must also say that it actually is quite nice that I know many of the people personally that I'm talking to, and that, that helps a lot as well. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for participating. It's a privilege for us to have you with us, but I'd also like to thank in particular Lucia, um, for Haley, for Catherine and Renuka, and belatedly Sarita for giving presentations and finding their, their time to do so. But this wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have the support from people like Suchi and Shantala. And I'm sure there are people behind the scenes that we don't know about who have made this whole thing happen as well. So we sincerely thank them. So at the end of this here, um, we will be running further webinars. And the shape of these webinars will be determined by what you tell us you want. And um, as a consequence, please do not finish your relationship with IUBS webinars at this particular point. Do keep sending us material and, and ideas and concepts, and we will make sure that we are able to address these and have these in future webinars. This is a great start. And let's hope that it is the beginning of a, of a new realm where we are looking at far greater women participation in the higher echelons of science. Once more, thank you very much indeed. It's been a privilege being a part of this and you've all been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Thank you for the lovely moderation, I would say. And thank you everyone, all the speakers for your exciting talks. And I would like to thank Shashi for joining and Natalie from the organizing team and our team members who are working behind the scenes, uh, all India Bioscience team members and Tejashrini who has created all the, who has done all the design works uh, for this webinar. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank the participants who are patient enough and listening to the talk from start to the end and sitting there for two hours. Um, thank you all once again. Uh, Shantala, if you want to add any comment at the end. And yeah, that's all. None, Suchi, just thank you. And uh, it, it was a really fun discussion. So thank you all for joining and including us. And please submit your feedback. Uh, here is the link, it's there. And also once the webinar is over, it will lead you to the feedback uh, page. So please submit your feedback. Your feedback is important to us. Thank you and ta-da, bye-bye. I'm ending the webinar here. Bye-bye.